and people who've had EV experiences. This is Joe Latto. I'm Dave Goldstein from the Electric Vehicle Association of Washington, D.C. This is Jill Sorensen, who is the Executive Director of the Baltimore Electric Vehicle Initiative. It's worldwide. Uh, we have in the audience a number of electric vehicle owners and enthusiasts. I wonder if those of you who are electric vehicle owners would please stand up and come. Woo! Oh. <laughs> are there any people here who have not seen Kill the Electric? Uh, make sure you see it, because uh, it's very important uh, for those of us who experienced that, uh, that have been long-time electric vehicle enthusiasts. There was a period of time where we had a lot of hope, because there was a zero emission mandate in California um, that brought about a lot electric cars, and then it was quickly dashed by having the vehicles crushed. Yeah. Does everybody remember that movie? Remember that feeling, the terrible feeling of being, all of us were crushed when they crushed the EV1? Uh, we had the sense that even before that happened, that Detroit was not really sincere about building electric cars. It was all green, green, what's it, what do you call it? Greenwashing. Greenwashing, yeah. yeah. It's a turf grass movement. And now we see a rebirth of the electric car. The question is, is it real or is it imaginary? If you believe the movie that we saw today, which by the way I think everybody agrees is a fantastic movie, am I correct on that? Yay! <laughs> Criticism of this audience of this movie? Nearly one, I would just say. The question here is I think the question, the first question I want to ask, and I want Jill Sorensen to help me with this, is um, where are we going? Are we truly at the beginning of a nirvana for electric cars? If you feel that spirit of this movie, you would say yes. But to those of us who are veterans, the question is is it real or is it tokenism? Are these things that we're seeing happening from companies like Tesla and General Motors and Ford, are they simply image builders again? Or are they sincere about building an electric future? And in the same token, um, are the pub is the public coming around to that point of view as well? Or is it, as Bob Lutz says, the American public goes where the gasoline prices are? Jill, I'm going to throw that one back to you. Uh, well, let's say something that we know to be true, but Prices, gas prices are going up, and more and more folks see the vehicles. We have volts. Uh, we're able to drive them now. And in part, we're able to drive them because we made a couple of calls to GM. We were getting a little impatient. Where are these vehicles? Uh, I was on a wait list, I think, for about six weeks. Six weeks? I was on uh, waiting list for nine months. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I oh, think I what we're seeing is... Wait what was your waiting list, please? Oh, uh, let's see. I uh, Jeffrey. put my reservation on in uh, no, uh, April of 2010. I got mine November 2nd. And the car you year. waited for? Yeah. The Nissan Leaf. Nissan Leaf, which you'll oh, see excellent. outside, right? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. My, my wait wasn't that long. <laughs> but I went, I went to GM and I said, I'm desperate. I need a car now. If you can deliver it now, I'll buy it. Otherwise, I'm getting a Nissan Leaf. <laughs> we have a number of questions we want to raise on this situation, but first of all, I want to introduce Wallace Rumbarker, who is the leading sales executive here in the Washington metropolitan area for the Smart Electric Car from Tyson's Corner. Wallace, the name of your dealership? It's the Smart Center of Tyson's Corner. We're in the Mercedes-Benz building in Tyson's area, and we will have the Smart Electric Drive available for sale hopefully middle of next year. Right now it's available as a lease only because we still are in the pre-production phase and we're testing it out. Wallace, but I have one right out front if you want to take a look at it. It's a beautiful car, I think we'd all agree, but Wallace, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you how many how many of these smart cars, electric smart cars, would be likely to see in the coming year? We don't know. Um, they are turning them out from the factory as we speak. They've been in production since September. Uh, so far, one of every ten cars that comes off the production line is an electric drive. And it's just a question of how many orders we get placed here. We'll start taking orders sometime in the spring. But people can come to you right now? They can come to us right now, take a test drive in the current one. If you want one right now, we'll lease you the, I'll lease you the one we have outside first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. And, uh, but the real question is, how much are they? 
I can't answer that question. They have not told us that yet. Well, how much are they to lease? Uh, to lease, it's five ninety nine a month, which is in line with the other electric vehicles that are available. Joe, would you say that's in line? Or would you... It sounds a little high. Uh, but maybe As I said, it is a pre-production prototype. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Joe? I'm sorry. What's your, what's your lease? Can you guys hear me? Uh, my lease, it's a $410. Um, $410. And, yeah, and Jeffrey? I didn't lease mine per se, but it would have been about 410 But compare this to the, uh, uh, the uh, Mini E. Now, the Mini E, when that was leased in New York, New Jersey, and California, that was leased for $800 per month. Mm -hmm. So it's already come down a lot. restrictions? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yes, Mileage there are there are my list restrictions. You can you can choose which lease you, you buy uh, for GM. Uh, you can do fifteen thousand miles or twelve thousand miles. Right. And the leaf is a fifteen thousand by default, and I think it's a uh, a uh, dollar a uh, thousand miles. Some some. Yeah, it's relatively amount. inexpensive you once know, you go a, over it. A fixed uh, fixed uh, ratio, so you can get as much miles as you want, as long as you prepay it. Jeffrey, why don't you introduce yourself to the... Oh, uh, I'm Jeffrey Jacobs, and I run the Affordable Electric Car Now website, aecn.timehorse.com. Great. Bob, why don't you introduce Bob Bruniga here <laughs> is also one of the people who drives an electric car, but unlike, uh, unlike the rest of us, Bob actually built his own, modified his own electric Prius. Is that correct, Bob? Yes. Um, I got two, there are two electric Priuses, uh, plug-in hybrids out in front. They've got solar panels on the top. Uh, I, I buy them from junkyards total and then try to fix them up, uh, low, low cost entry into electric cars. And you also have been one of the first people in the Electric Vehicle Association to try to answer the question, what are we going to do for range anxiety? How many people here suffer from range anxiety when it comes to electric cars? Can I have some brave hands here? Does pretty much everybody worry about just how far you could go if it was an all electric car like a LEAF for example? By the way, how far can you go, Jeffrey? Well, I find, uh, you know, it depends. It's getting pretty cold now. So uh, in a day like um, last Friday, which was one of my uh, most difficult days, but I did get home. Uh, I got about, uh, let's see, 30, 16. Uh, on 80% charge, I got about uh, 60 or so miles. And that's 80%, not 100%. Now, at 100%, I can usually get at least 80 but on some days, I can get actually much farther than that. I can get up to 120, and in, in the springtime, expect me to get 120, 130 on a full charge. Okay, very, very good. Let me, let me speak to the range ahead. anxiety. Yeah. I, I had one of the home-built vehicles for many years, for five plus years. Um, it was uh, it was built by engineers in California, and it actually had a five-page photocopy of owner's manual. And in the owner's manual, it said it had a 50-mile range. And uh, when the batteries were broken in, in the summer, I had 50 plus mile range. Once you actually do a trip that is the, a maximum range, your range anxiety drops tremendously because anything that's shorter than that, you realize you can easily do. Um, so it's something that occurs, but it only really lasts for a short period of time when you're getting used to the vehicle. And then a few months into owning the vehicle, range anxiety really drops off. Well, I, I actually would say that I've, now I'm driving a Volt, so I have developed gas anxiety. I, I haven't had to put any gas, and I really don't want to. My husband thinks it's a, a little strange that I'd rather not drive the vehicle somewhere because it's charging. And uh, he, he thinks that's really very unusual behavior. But, you know, you do take for granted that we just get up and go and we drive anywhere we want, and, and we'll drive two blocks to the grocery store instead of walking. Uh, so, yeah, gas but, anxiety. But you could go as far as maybe 350 miles on your yeah, and I'm averaging about 146 miles to the gallon. Uh, I have used some gas. Could you say that again? 146, 146 miles, per miles per to the gallon. gallon because I have I have used some gas. I have a Volt as well. Joe? Um, when I first bought the vehicle, um, I had to bring it from the dealership. That's when I used uh, 1.3 gallons of gasoline. And then I didn't use any gasoline for a good six months or so. Um, and uh, I had actually pushed it up to about 800 miles to the gallon. <laughs> <Whoa. Nice. laughs> and, then, okay. uh, and then I drove it to Wisconsin and then back, which brought my mileage way down to 
to about you know, 90 miles to a gallon. No. One of the things that we do as vault owners is that you don't want to have blue in your bubble. This is the thing. <laughs> so if, you, if you have a green bubble, if you keep it in EV, it's always this nice shiny green bubble. But anytime you can use gasoline, it gives you a little wedge of how much you've used in terms of gasoline. And, and you find yourself complaining about you know, getting you're not getting 100 miles to the gallon, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous, and having blue in your bubble, it's like it ruins your day to have blue in your bubble. Well, how important is it, panel members? I, I should answer, there's one other point about rage anxiety, anxiety, which is very important, that uh, there are many places where you can charge your car in the D.C. area right that now. That was my question, where and how many are there? How's the infrastructure? Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, well, one thing is that uh, there's a charge point network. So in charge point, you get these little cards. They're very handy. I recommend anyone with an EV get one of these. Uh, you just go to chargepoint.com. <laughs> there you go. And you can draw, drive up to any of the many charge points. There's about, oh, I don't know, something on the order of 70 uh, active charge points, and they're growing all the time the in the DC area. And you just tap your card against the charging station. You pull out the uh, charge cord. You plug it into your car. You're good to go. When you're done, you tap it again and you put it back. How long? Um, well, the Leaf has a what's called a 3.3 kilowatt charger, which means that it goes from zero to 100 in about seven hours on one of those Coulomb chargers. One of the that's, higher price from, chargers, though, will go about uh, half that amount. Well, we don't have any in the area, as far as I know, that are the uh, what they're called Cha Demo or uh, basically it's DC really fast, fast charge. Really fast charge. Uh, but yeah, if you had one of those, it's a very, very thick cord, and uh, it would charge your leaf, for instance, in uh, from zero to eighty percent in uh, twenty-five or so minutes. Okay, we have limited time for question and answers here. Right? Yeah. Bob Bruniger has a different take on the on the issue, and I, can you try to do this, Bob? Real quick, have a number of charts here. Yeah, uh, I've been driving an electric car, uh, not the, the solar Prius, but I've been driving an electric car for about twenty years, and my number one frustration is that I park within six feet of a 110 volt outlet and in 20 years I still do not have permission to plug into that <laughs> and I tell them just tell me I will pay you know the electric rate per month for the authority to plug into this thing but just nobody I, I work on a federal installation nobody can figure out how to say okay we'll take your ten dollars a month and now you can plug in because that's all it, uh, it costs to charge uh, a car that 10 miles 10 miles to and from work it's uh, ten dollars a month is what it's going to cost to charge and so that is my uh, crusade that I'm on is we've got to be working on this charging at work. The car sits there for eight hours and the public charger is, is for, you know, when you, you're going to do something unusual. But the, the electric car really is for, for the commuter and we've got to get out of this uh, gas tank analogy where you fill up and then run till empty. That's not an electric car, that's a gas car. An electric car is like your laptop um, or your cell phone. You plug it in when it's not in use so that it's always available. We live in Virginia Beach, and there's only one public charger that shows up on charge point. And the fee is $1.50 an hour. Yes. Now, if we plug our volt in for four hours and pay $6, why would I do that when it's only $1.25 when I plug it in at, at my house? One thing that I remember, being old enough to remember 1973, October, when I stood in long lines to get at any price get gasoline. It was almost a dollar a gallon. It seemed astronomical at the time. Um, I've got a vehicle now that I've got alternatives. Um, I can still, you know, with a fast charger, I can probably recharge it four times if I had to. Um, and also, $6 uh, for a recharge may sound, uh, that may be considerably cheap when gasoline is nine bucks a gallon. We all have more to add. Come outside, join us, see the electric cars out front. We'll be glad to ask any kind of questions. Thanks so much.